my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Babylist. The people at Babylist believe that you should be able to get exactly what you need for your unique and growing family. That's why their baby registry lets you add any item from any store. You can even add cool services and favors like prenatal yoga, doula support, home cooked meals, or dog walking. Start your registry today to be eligible for a free Hello Baby box of goodies for baby worth up to $190 while boxes last. At the end of this episode, we'll be talking more about baby lists and all the things we love about their service. I also wanted to share two quick announcements. One is the Know Your Options Childbirth course is still open and available, and it's $100 off with the coupon code 100OFF. You can find it on the website by navigating to the courses section and clicking on Know Your Options course. Let me know if you have any questions about that. You can send a message through the website as well at thebirthhour.com. The other announcement is our Patreon group is growing quickly, going strong. The Facebook group is like popping. So many conversations going on every day. I can almost not keep up with all of them and just so much support and great advice there. You also get access to our entire archive of episodes as well as bonus content every month by becoming a listener supporter via Patreon at patreon.com slash birth hour. All right, today's episode is with Bryn, which is so weird to have another Bryn um, on the podcast, but she reached out to me wanting to share her experience with ICP or cholestasis of pregnancy. This is actually ICP Awareness Month, so this is an important story to share right now especially, and I've had so many people reach out to me over the months and even the last couple of years since we've shared some ICP stories saying that they would not have known to look for the symptoms and signs of this had it not been for the birth hour. So I feel really strongly about continuing to share these stories as well. Hi, Bryn. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia with my husband, Hershey, and our three kids. Uh, Elias is five, Eden Joy is three and a half, and Israel is seven weeks old. All right, so we're going to focus mostly on your newest little one and and their arrival, but do you want to just tell us a little bit about kind of your past with what you've chosen around birth, and then we'll get into how this pregnancy went. Yeah, absolutely. Um, With both Elias and Eden, I wanted an unmedicated birth, um, and Elias was in a hospital with midwives, and Eden Joy was in a birth center with midwives as well. And so going into this, I knew that I definitely wanted unmedicated, and I definitely wanted a birth center. So how did your pregnancy go? Uh, I've had really normal pregnancies. This one was uh, a little harder. Uh, I had a lot of anxiety, especially in the first trimester. Um, It just didn't really make sense to me that I could have three healthy pregnancies, perfect births, and wonderful children. So I was just really afraid that whole first trimester that something was going to go wrong. Um, I also had a lot of morning sickness. Uh, It was I was actually throwing up, which I didn't really have with the other two. So that made it harder, especially with having little ones running around. But otherwise, up until I hit my third trimester, everything was really normal. So once the morning sickness eased up a little bit, how was the rest of your pregnancy and into the third trimester? Uh, Starting in my third trimester, uh, right around 31 weeks, I started itching um, on the palms of my hands. um, And... I had never heard of cholestasis before until I was about 12 weeks pregnant with Israel. And um, I actually heard about it on your podcast, the one with Nicole Phelps, where she talked about her experience with cholestasis. Um, And then also in November, just about a month before this, uh, a friend of mine who I attended her birth, she was induced for cholestasis. And so um, I it was like fresh on my mind. And so when I started itching, I I was started thinking, could that be what this is? But 
you know, when I had heard about cholestasis, it was always really severe itching and it was everywhere. It was nonstop. You couldn't sleep. Um, and my experience was really different. I was really mild. It didn't happen every day and it was only happening at night. So, um, I really didn't think that it was, but because of the anxiety that I had, and especially in that first trimester, I just decided to check with my midwife. So I, the itching had started on a Thursday, and I was supposed to have an appointment that day, but they ended up moving it to Monday. So Thursday and Friday, I was really itchy that night. Um, and then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I didn't have it at all. And so I debated talking to her about it, but decided that if I didn't say something, I would, it would really eat at me. And so uh, when I went in for my 32-week appointment, I mentioned it, and she decided to give me the blood test just to be safe. Um, about a week later, it takes about five days for the, for the results to come in, she called me, and I'll never forget, I was driving on my way to brunch. I was visiting my mom for her birthday, and um, she said, your test paint came back, normal level is 10, and you were at a 13. And I was just in total shock. I went into denial at that point where I just didn't think I could possibly have it. I hadn't itched in days. I'd had a little here and there in the last week, but um, it had been probably three or four days since I had been itchy at all. And it just didn't make sense to me that I could have it because even when I had itching, it wasn't severe at all. Um, I had had no sign of it in my past pregnancies. Uh, the only symptom was itching. I didn't have anything else. It was really frustrating because I knew that even though I didn't feel like I had it, I could no longer be at the birth center. Yeah. Did she say at that point what 13, because 13, you know, doesn't sound like that much more than 10, you know, but is it just like if you're anything over 10, you have it and it's going to increase? Exactly. Okay. And it also was really hard because my friend who was induced for cholestasis, she was 39 weeks. So they went ahead with the induction before her results came back. Mm -hmm. um, and her results came back at 14 and they told her she didn't have it because there's a wide range on what different providers think oh. is actually dangerous. And her provider decided it was 20 that they would have induced for. Mm -hmm. And so I had a really hard time accepting that if I had had another care provider um, consulting on the case that I could have stayed at the birth center. Yeah. I asked them at that point if I could get my levels rechecked because I hadn't itched in a few days. So I thought maybe it had gone back down past 10. I asked them if they could ask someone else, get a second opinion. And um, yes, I could have done all of those things, but they said because I had gotten an abnormal result, I would still risk out. Um, and at that point, I was 33 weeks. And so they decided to drop me as a client. Um, and so that was also really hard because I had about a month to find a new practitioner and that wasn't enough time for me to build trust and to feel comfortable with whoever I chose. So um, we ended up choosing a hospital, um, an OB group that my husband, he works with that system so that we could just make it as cheap as possible because we'd already paid the bar center in full. At that point, I was so frustrated and upset that I didn't care who was doing it. I felt like anyone who was there was just not going to respect my wishes and I was going to be fighting no matter who it was. And so that felt like the most practical decision to me. I'm thankful now that I was tested when I was and that if I had been any later in the pregnancy, I would have still had to been in a hospital and um, it just wouldn't have given me any time to process. And I feel like I was able to go in with a better mindset because I had that month to process. But that month was really, really hard. I spent a lot of my time crying <laughs> because even though I knew that this was the best option and them putting me on medication gave my baby the best chance. And me, it, it got rid of any symptoms that in that month I itched only a few days, and even then only at night because of the medication they put me on. Um, my doctors, I only had two appointments with them. 
I was going to a high risk doc every week for ultrasounds. Um, and so it was a lot of in and out of the hospital because that's where their offices were just dragging my two older kids around. Uh, it just felt really chaotic. And there was a part of me that was ashamed, even though that doesn't make any sense that I, my body would betray me and my baby like this. And so I didn't talk to anybody about it. Uh, My husband and a few of my close friends were the only ones that even knew I had cholestasis. We made the decision to not tell anyone when I was getting induced because I just couldn't deal with any more stress. And I felt like having people know when I was getting induced and having the pressure of texting everybody and letting, keeping them updated was just too much. I could only deal with my stress level, but, um, going to the doctors, even just those two appointments, all of it was really confusing. Every single person I talked to had a different opinion on what was going to happen with the baby, with the induction, with me. Um, there's not a ton of research into cholestasis. It's considered pretty rare. I do think it's on the rise because I've seen quite a few people with it now. And since I've been diagnosed, a lot of people have told me, oh yeah, I know this person that had that. And even the Uh, One of the doctors told me that they had three cholestasis inductions that last month. But even with it being on the rise, they still couldn't tell me exactly what this would look like. One doctor told me that he would for sure go to the NICU, that he would for sure have some respiratory issues and to prepare for that. Um, Another one told me that he would for sure have to stay in the nursery and be separated from me for at least 24 hours just to make sure that he was okay. And another one told me that everything was going to be perfectly fine, that there's no reason to think that anything would go wrong at all. Um, With the induction, I had so many questions because um, I'm actually trained as a doula. And so I know the process, but I was trying to figure out what was best for me and what the hospital would normally do and how my vision would fit in with theirs. A lot of people told me that the induction would take days, um, that it could be a really, really long process and to expect to be in it for the long haul. Um, And I had another doctor, a few nurses tell me that, you know, your body's done this twice before. There's no reason to think that this is going to take any time at all. Um, This is going to be a super fast induction. And all of these things were said with so much confidence that it was really confusing because I really did not know what to expect on any front. The most helpful resource I found um, when doing research on cholestasis was icpcare.org. It's a website dedicated to cholestasis research. Their site is super easy to navigate, and they've got everything I could possibly need to know on the site. Um, They've got everything from tips on how to manage your symptoms through diet. They've got tons of research articles. They have support groups so that you can connect with other mothers who have had cholestasis. Um, They have frequently asked questions. They've got a list of symptoms and things that could potentially happen, complications. That was the most helpful to me because I had an idea of what to expect. A lot of them were really scary things, but at least I knew that these things could happen and that helped me prepare mentally for the worst. So we decided to schedule the induction for 37 weeks exactly. The official recommendation is doing it between 36 and 37 weeks, but because my levels stayed pretty low, um, they did end up rising, but only to 14. And so they thought it was safe to put it off um, to, to that 37 week mark, which made me feel a lot more comfortable because, um, it, respiratory issues are a common side effect or with cholestasis, um, for the baby. And so I wanted to give his lungs as much time to mature as possible. Um, I went in on the night of the seventh, um, but there weren't enough beds. And so they sent me home which ended up being a really huge blessing because I was able to sleep. I don't know what I was thinking, scheduling an induction for 10 p.m., knowing that I'd have to labor through the night, and I've done that twice before, and it's miserable. So um, they ended up calling me back at 5 the next morning, and they were ready for me. I was admitted around 6 a.m. on the 8th. Shift change slowed things down a lot, so I didn't actually start the induction until 9.30. I chose to get a dose of Cytotec, 
um, to start off my labor. And they had told me that typically you had three or four doses of Cytotec before uh, contractions really started. So I was prepared for it to take a little while. To So I decided that I was just going to rest um, and wait for things to start kicking in. Um, so when the induction started, my cervix was closed high and thick. Um, and so they were expecting to need a good bit. Um, so Cytotec is given every four hours. And so we were expecting at least probably 12 before anything actually happened. Um, I, so I got the first dose of Cytotec at 930. Um, and my contractions actually started around noon. Um, they were really light and sometimes I wasn't even sure if I was actually feeling them or if I was just imagining them, but, um, I was hooked to a fetal monitor the whole time and they were picking up contractions and they were coming about every minute. So because the Cytotec was causing me to have contractions so often, even though they weren't hard, they decided that they weren't going to do a second dose. Um, but it, that one dose managed to get me to two centimeters and 50% effaced. So they were able to place a Foley balloon, this, uh, plastic balloon that they fill with water in your cervix. It's supposed to mimic the baby's head and so that it will manually dilate you. They did that around one thirty, Um, and it was funny, the resident, I talked to her about what I was able to do with an, an induction. Typically, you know, you're on a monitor at all times, and which really limits your movements. And having had natural births in the past, that's all I know is walking around and, and moving to get contractions moving and, and to use gravity to get things uh, dilated. The resident actually permitted me to walk the halls and to have 45 minutes off the monitor at a time, which was such a blessing because I, you know, if I had had anybody else, I probably would not have been allowed to do that. Um, My poor nurse was so flustered because she said I was the first person she'd ever seen walking around with a Foley balloon, which was really funny to me because the Foley balloon needs gravity in order to work you have like tubes that come out. She stuck them to my leg with tape and I was, but blood was coming out and getting my leg all bloody or my pants all bloody. And, um, she, she didn't know what to do with that. And all the nurses in the hall kept coming up to me and be like, your pants are getting bloody. You, um, you're making a mess of your pants. You should, you should go back to your room. I was like, I'm in labor. Of course I'm bleeding. <laughs> That's how this is supposed to work. And I just thought it was so funny that all these L&D nurses were so worried about this little bit of blood. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the walking was super beneficial. Um, they, the contractions were still really light. It was definitely early labor, but they were coming every minute. And that Foley balloon, they checked me around four and it actually dilated me to a six and got me 80% of face. So that was super effective. And my body actually took over, um, the contractions at that point. And so I didn't, they determined that I didn't need Pitocin, um, which I'm also so thankful for because, you know, at that point I, I'd had natural births and I definitely wanted one, but I'd heard so many stories about Pitocin and, working as a doula, I'd seen inductions with Pitocin and I was really afraid of that. And so I I planned on getting an epidural just to avoid all of that extra pain. But because I didn't need Pitocin, the goal again was to have an unmedicated birth. I did end up hiring a doula, my mentor from when I, uh, I was trained. Um, she is the sweetest human ever and came all the way from Alabama to come be with me. Um, so when she came, I was still in early labor. Um, it was frustrating for me in that my training really got in my head. I know like the stages of labor and I could tell from how I was acting that I was still in pretty early labor. Um, And, you know, I was able to talk through them. I was able to joke. Um, They weren't super painful. And so I got in my head about I'm, my body's not dilating. Like I'm not, I'm not progressing. 
Uh, something to know from my last two labors is I would hit a wall with both of them. It was at seven centimeters and eight centimeters where I could not go into transition. And now I'm sure I would have eventually, but um, it was like my body just stopped responding to the contractions. And both times I needed my water broken before I would hit transition. And so I knew this about my body. I knew that I have a hefty bag for a water sack and that in order to get to that next step, I would likely need my water broken again. So when they checked me, uh, it was around 8.45 that night, um, I was still at a six, which was so frustrating because, you know, it was almost five hours after the last time they checked me. And I was definitely in active labor at that point. Things were starting to get really painful. I was starting to hit my pain threshold, um, you know, and I got really lucky because in addition to my doula, I had a wonderful nurse who had had natural births herself. And so she was super encouraging. Um, she allowed me to be off the monitors as much as I wanted. You know, I wanted to get in the shower, which was a huge helper for me in the last ones. And she was like, don't worry about the monitors. We'll check on you every once in a while. Um, but let's just, let's just get you that natural birth. And, um, so having them there is the reason I ended up with an unmedicated birth because once I heard at 845 that I was still at a six, I just felt so defeated and I was like, okay, give me, give me that epidural. I'm, I'm done. I cannot take any more pain than this. And I knew that if they broke my water, I'd be in more pain because that's how transition works. So they were really great about you know, let's let's try to come up with uh, another plan. We can get you an epidural, but are there things you want to try first before we do that? And um, so I agreed at that point that I would get checked again and I would let them break my water before deciding anything else because, you know, epidurals can be super helpful and wonderful. And um, there are lots of people that that helps them get to the end. Um, I know plenty of people who have stopped dilating um, and then they get the epidural and it gets them to completion. But for me, um, I already, I have fears associated with that where, the, you know, I'm afraid of getting a spinal headache or the back pain or it, all of those things. Um, I just, so I, even though I wanted one, I also was afraid to get one. Just like, even though I wanted a natural birth, I was afraid of more pain. Um, so they, I stayed in the shower for a little while longer and, um, at nine 30, um, they checked me again. I was still at a six. Um, I think I was a little more faced at that point, but I had made no progress. And this is the point where I just had a mental breakdown. <laughs> I was just so upset, um, that I was just like, no, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, I don't want this anymore. Get this baby out of me. Um, but I still agreed to let them break my water. And I actually received fentanyl at that point. My nurse had told me that that's what they, that's one of the drugs they put in an epidural. I was like, great, let's do it. Let's get some kind of pain relief. They did not have the option of nitrous oxide. And so it was the medication that had the lowest um, half-life. And I, I was concerned about passing it on to the baby and the baby being drowsy and not wanting to breastfeed at birth. So I wanted the drug that was going to affect him the least. Um, and so as they were breaking my water, they gave me fentanyl. And um, it took about three contractions for me to go into transition. <laughs> I was in complete labor land at that point. I No one was around. I could, like, grunt orders. Uh, I, but I got in a really good zone with that. It was, it was hard because my mind was really foggy because of the fentanyl. Um, but it gave me enough, um, of a relief for me to focus and to get through that period. Um, so I felt the urge to push at 10, 20, and the baby was born at 1024. <laughs> um, so it was a really short transition period. It was a really short pushing period. And um, he was here. 
Wow, that is short. How does that compare to your other two with pushing? Elias was about a half hour, and then Eden was three pushes. I got oh, the fetal yeah. ejection reflex with her and Israel. Yeah, so so the, that thing is that. the best. Yeah. <laughs> so how was he when he came out? I know you mentioned different care providers had kind of prepared you for different things. He was perfect. He came out kicking and screaming. He had Apgar's uh, scores of eight and nine, just as good as either of my full-term babies. Um, so that was a huge blessing, a huge weight off my shoulders to know that he was healthy because that just doesn't always happen. Um, especially because he was taken three weeks early. Um, my kids are really close to due date. My daughter was actually born on her due date. And so I knew that this was early for him. Um, my postpartum was really good. i this is probably my best postpartum aside from, um, he had pretty bad jaundice, which is really common with um, cholestasis babies since cholestasis is a liver issue. Um, and we had to get one of those billy beds. Um, thankfully, we were able to have it at home. But he was just stuck on this little light for 24 hours, and it was so hard not to hold my newborn baby. Um, but other than the jaundice, he did really great. Um, I didn't have any tearing and so my postpartum recovery was super easy. Um, I actually used the Earth Mama organic uh, perennial spray, which was amazing. I uh, couldn't recommend that more. Um, and yeah, it's you know we're still kind of in it. We just came out of the six weeks, um, but with COVID, we <laughs> I have not gone to that appointment. But I'm assuming everything's okay. Yeah, have your well checks been just postponed or? Yes. Um, they, they have no idea when I will end up having it, but because the practice is actually in the hospital, they're not allowing anyone in for anything that isn't an emergency. Okay. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to share from postpartum or want to just go ahead and share some resources? Yeah, absolutely. Um, ICP care made all the difference for me. I feel like they had the best, most accurate information. Um, even when my doctors couldn't tell me what to expect, they could. Um, and having a support group is was just huge because I didn't want to turn to anybody in my life because I didn't want them to be scared. Uh, another thing that I would recommend to any pregnant woman is chiropractic care, just to get your body um in optimal position and also baby. Um, it helps so much with positioning. Uh, after my first visit, I noticed a huge difference in his positioning. My, my babies had always needed to turn the extra bit, which made my labors longer. And, um, because I, I really think that this labor was a lot shorter because he was in optimal position. And I also, I recommend going to a Webster certified chiropractor because they work specifically with pregnant women. And he, I've actually brought Israel to the chiropractor since he's been born and it helped with latch issues, which was really, really awesome. Um, again, just that first visit, I noticed a huge difference. Um, I also really encourage uh, childbirth classes or a doula. Um, having my doula there, if I had not had her, I don't think I would have had an unmedicated birth, which um, I knew I really wanted. And I think it made all the difference for that last bit. Um, and childbirth classes, just having ideas going in, um, just being able to switch up the plan, being able to switch up positioning, um, they it just really prepares you for an unmedicated birth. Um, and the book I always read when I'm pregnant is IMA's Guide to Childbirth. I love that book. I love that woman, <laughs> and it's just really encouraging to read other people's birth stories, and hearing birth stories uh, may just really helps empower and encourage. Thank you so much for sharing your story and all of those resources. We'll put those on the show notes page, and then people can also leave comments for you there if they want to connect, and I'll make sure that you see them. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And I'm glad I got to talk about cholestasis and how it doesn't always have to be the severe itching. I just want women to know that if even if you have mild itching, ask your provider. If this is not some a test that they just run, you have to ask for it. So if, if you feel like this is a possibility, it's really cheap. It's really easy. Ask your provider. Yeah, I think that's so important. And I've heard 
numerous stories from people who learned about ICP on this podcast and ended up having it. So it makes me wonder how often it isn't diagnosed if, you know, care providers aren't catching it and people are having to bring it up based on a podcast they heard. So I appreciate you helping spread that awareness too. Yeah, of course. I'm so glad to be able to talk about it because you're right. I'm, I, I was thinking the same thing that if I had not heard this podcast, if that birth hadn't been fresh in my mind, I never would have thought twice about it. All right. I wanted to chat with you guys a little bit about baby list today's sponsor. I know so many of you are having baby showers canceled with COVID-19 and that's such a huge disappointment. Um, but I want you guys to know that there's still obviously a way for people to shower you with gifts and love and baby list is a great way to do that. Aside from being a great resource, they have a page that they're updating constantly with resources to help you navigate this time. They also just have so many great features with their app and website when creating your registry. So I was just talking to a friend who's having her third baby and she hadn't created a baby registry yet. And of course, all of this has just turned her whole world upside down. And it's a crazy time, I know, but she actually found it really cathartic to sit down and create her baby registry and added things like, you know, meal delivery and daily harvest, which are those smoothies you get in the mail, like all kinds of things that might make it a little bit easier postpartum when not only do you have a new baby, but you're not supposed to be going out to all of the normal stores and everything. So I encourage you to look at their website for their baby registry because it really helps people to think outside of the box when it comes to gift giving. And of course, you can have all your normal stuff on there as far as, you know, the basics for baby and the gear and all of that. And they have wonderful sample registries and guides and everything to help you find the products that are perfect for you. But I think that where they really shine is with those services like dog walking and um, gift cards and stuff like that that might come in really, really handy. So it's babylist.com or you can download the Babylist app and just have fun creating a registry, send it out to your friends and family. People are really thinking about you during this time and they want to help. So I encourage everyone to reach out and ask for that help. I've also heard from a lot of people who are considering or have already had virtual baby showers with um, using Zoom or FaceTime or something like that. You can have everybody on at the same time and maybe arrange to have some of the gifts arrive ahead of time so you can open them on that call. I also saw a funny um, Facebook picture or meme or whatever that had this big box out in front of somebody's house and they wrapped it in blue tissue paper, like baby blue. And people were dropping off gifts kind of like in a drive by baby shower. And the mom was, you know, standing of course, six feet back, but you know, whatever's going to help you feel a little bit more connected and supported and celebrated during this time. I encourage you to kind of look at the things other people are doing. And I know it's not what you had in mind and not how you imagined celebrating your little one on the way, but um, there are things out there that can help you virtually. So again, I'm so grateful to Babylist for sponsoring this podcast for so many years now. And they're a great, great resource to follow online on their social media. It's Babylist on Instagram and Facebook. And then of course, babylist.com. Thank you so much again to Bryn for sharing her story today. You can go to thebirthhour.com and search for her name in the search bar to find her show notes page if you want more information. Also, if you want to join our Patreon group, it's patreon.com slash birthhour to become a listener supporter. And then last announcement before we sign off is the Know Your Options Childbirth course is still available with the coupon code 100 for $100 off. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.